All right, today's video is going to be about the Sea-Doo battery and everything that relates to it. Uh, how to test it, how to charge it, maintain it, and the different issues that it can cause your Sea-Doo if you are experiencing a low battery or a bad battery or something that's end of life. So if you're watching this video, you're probably here because you either want to know how to maintain the battery or you're interested in how a bad battery can affect your ski. So I'll start right off and say what can happen to your ski if the battery is near end of life. Um, the sea Doos have a very sensitive electrical system. And what that means is, um, you know, in a car, if, you're, if, if you have a bad battery, it might start to crank slow, but eventually it'll still start or you could jump it and it'll run fine. Um, sea Doos are a little bit different. You can experience all kinds of problems if your battery is near end of life. Um, you can have IBR faults. Uh, you can have a dash that refuses to light up even though the engine will crank. You could have, um, you wake the ski up and you get a few seconds before it'll beep and say your battery is low, even though you charge it and the battery's like 13 volts, so it would indicate that it's full. Um, there's all kinds of issues that can come up. Um, and the easiest way to tell if you have a good battery or a bad battery is to just get yourself a battery tester. Um, specifically one that can do a load test or something you can't just measure voltage on these batteries I see that a lot um, someone will have a bad battery but they put a multimeter on it and it comes back at like 12.5 volts or something so they assume the battery is good uh, but that's not the case um, the biggest part is to test a battery under load ie when you're cranking it what does the voltage go down to uh, because in this case uh, just like I mentioned earlier, the CDU voltage system, or the CDU electrical system, I should say, is very sensitive. So if you crank the engine and the battery gets down to around 10 volts or 10.5 volts, the ECU is not going to power on. So you might get your dash light up, you might get your speakers playing, you might get cranking and assume that your ski should start, but it's not, and you think you have another problem, uh, but it's just because the ECU is not turning on, and therefore it's not telling you the injectors what to do, it's not telling the spark plugs what to do. Um, and then, you know, the engine's just never going to start. So it's important to have a tester that can do a crank simulation or at least tell you uh, what the depth of charge and the cranking capability of the battery is. So let's get into that first. We'll go over the testing and then how to charge and how to identify other problems. All right, so I'm just going to connect the tester to the terminals here and get the negative. And where's my positive lead? Of course, why would that stay on? It's very hard to get a good bite in here. Hopefully that holds. And we'll get the positive. That's a good bite there. All right, this thing should be waking up. And you can see this tester uh, has a few different options. I'm not sure how good that comes up on camera. Uh, but we have the, uh, the battery status, the wave, which is just the voltage. Um, first, I'm going to go into wave here. Uh, actually, I have my ski on a charger right now. I'm going to disconnect that. All right, so if we go into wave, we can see that the battery is sitting around 12.8, 12, yeah, 12.8 volts. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wake the ski up, and we're going to see how much that changes. So, wake it up. This has put a minor, minor load on the electrical system. Uh, and you can see that dipped down to 12.6, 12.5 volts, 12.4. Um, <clears throat> so you can see this 12.3. This, this battery is pretty much end of life. And I'll do a test here in a second and I'll show you how to do that. 12.2, um, it's dropping fast. So, this battery's been on a charger since I winterized it. Um, a charger maintainer. I have a NOCO Genius 2X4 and it's just a uh, four bank, two amp charger and maintainer. Uh, so yeah, 12.1 volts, so it's dropping pretty quick. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go to the battery tab and this is going to uh, simulate a, like a load or a crank condition. Do a quick test here. Uh, it's definitely not 380. I think this battery is a 230. Hydro batteries are 230 cranking amps, cold cranking amps. 
Um, you, if you don't have a Hiju or if you're not sure, it, just look at the front sticker. It'll tell you what the CCA rating is. Okay, this is going to do a test. All right, so this is coming at uh, it's good condition. It's actually testing at 395 uh, cold cranking amps, but the state of charge is only 64%. So we know the cranking ability is there, but the state of charge is not. Um, that's a sign that this battery is pretty much end of life. So I'll have to replace this again as usual. You could do a quick test or a standard test. I usually just do quick test on this. Um, uh, this, this tester here, it's the MotoPower MP051-5A. Uh, you don't have to use this specifically. Pretty much any battery tester you can find on Amazon will work perfectly fine. Um, essentially, all I'm getting at is that you, you can't just rely specifically on the voltage. Uh, because if someone looks at this right now and they put a probe on the battery and they get 12.4, 12.5 volts, uh, they would say, yeah, this battery is fine. You know, it's a 12 volt battery and it's at 12 and a half volts. That means it's got to be good. Um, when it very clearly is not So That's it for the battery testing. We'll just pull that off real quick um, The next is charging now On these batteries you don't want to use a like a, a full-size automotive battery charger You don't want to send 10 15 20 50 amps to it. You need a small trickle charge um, And there's there's a ton of batteries on the market. The two biggest ones are the battery tender. Um, you can see this has a very low load. I'm not sure if that comes up on camera or not, but this is only 750 milliamps. Um, and you can see that this is a battery charger and maintainer. So it'll charge the battery up until it's full. It hits a certain voltage um, and then it'll kind of just discharge the battery, charge it back up, discharge and charge it back up. And what that's doing is it's keeping the cells active and preventing them from sulfating. Um, and sulfating is it's a condition that happens to batteries when they sit idle and are not being used. That's why any battery that's on a shelf has a shelf life. If it's not being used, it'll eventually go bad. Um, and these prevent that. I have another one here. This is a Noco Genius 1. The one indicates the amperage that it puts in the batteries. This is another good one. Um, if you're looking for a battery tender, I would look between act the actual brand name battery tender and a Noco Genius. Um, they're the two biggest players in the market, but you know any charger from Amazon will also do uh, fairly decently. In this case, like I said earlier, I have a uh, Genius 2 uh, by 4 so this is just a, uh, it pumps out 2 amps per channel, and you can see I'm charging uh, another ski battery here. This is a Uasa. Um, funny enough, this battery's about 3 years old now, and it's in better condition than the Hiju battery in here that's brand new as of um, what about six months or so ago uh, it's just it's incredible it's crazy how bad those batteries are um, so I actually added a charge port on the side here and it essentially just ties in to the terminals on the battery I, I only did that so I don't have to take the seats off every time I want to charge some people will just put clamps on and then have the leads come out of the side here here uh, but you'd only have to do that Really, um, you just can put the, the charge leads, clamp them onto the battery, and you're good to go. Now, if you keep your ski outside in uh, for storage, the best idea would be to remove the battery and keep it inside somewhere. Um, cold conditions can affect the batteries, especially if you're charging them. So if you're going to keep your ski outside for storage, it's best to remove the battery and bring it inside. Uh, for now, I'm just going to go ahead and plug this in. And start this back up yes 12 volt AGM um, the next thing I want to talk about is all the different things that can go wrong uh, if your battery's end of life now it's 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 kind of unfortunate these that these uh, the CDUs are so sensitive to voltage fluctuations and all kinds of electrical things because of the battery uh, because it scares a lot of people uh, especially now that CDU is using those cheaper batteries uh, because you'll, you'll buy a brand new ski, you think everything's ready to go, and you head out to the water, and you have an IBR fault, or there's you're getting all these check engine lights for sensors that aren't starting up, or whatever. Um, and a majority of the time, it's just because the battery is bad, uh, or it's, it's not charged all the way. 
Uh, in all honesty, the Hyju batteries are just too subpar for these uh, machines. They just don't put out enough juice, uh, especially on these newer machines because, you know, on the 325s, there's a heated oxygen sensor, so that's putting a load on. Um, you have the sound system, some of the, like the GTX Limited, you have your depth finder, especially the, the Explorer, uh, the fishing series. There's just so many electronics and you, have, uh, you obviously have the nicer screen on the, on the skis now. So there's just, there's so much electronics going on in these skis uh, that those new factory batteries just can't handle it. So it's a very long winded way to say, if you have a brand new machine and you take it out and you have some kind of electrical problem or you're getting check engine lights, um, don't worry, check out your battery first. Mm -hmm. Get yourself a battery tester and check it and see if it's just your battery that's causing all these problems. Um, or better yet, as soon as you take your new Sea-Doo home, get rid of that piece of crap battery and just put a nice one in. Um, it, it's worth it. It's worth the peace of mind. Uh, these ones can barely handle the ski as it is. The last thing you want to do is, you know, you're out riding, you find a nice spot to pull over, you listen to your music for 15-20 minutes, and now your ski won't start because the battery just can't keep up with it. Um, definitely worth investing in a different battery. The next thing I want to bring up is the lithium batteries. Um, now a lot of people think when they hear lithium they get instantly turned off, they say lithium and water don't mix. Uh, there's a big difference between lithium ion, uh, lithium ion and the newer chemistry which is pretty much what all batteries are using which is lithium iron phosphate. Um, lithium iron phosphate is far more stable. Um, it's been used in power sports for years now. Uh, especially as of late, uh, side-by-sides, quads, motorcycles, dirt bikes, um, and especially PWCs. Uh, they're even being used for house batteries on larger boats uh, because the, the, the depth of charge and the voltage cap capability of a lithium battery is just so, so much better than an AGM. So I see a lot of people mentioning, you know, should I put a lithium iron phosphate battery in? Uh, NOCO has one. There's a few other uh, vendors that offer them. Um, and there's pros and cons to lithium batteries in CDUs. Um, I'll list the, the pros off. The pros are you get a, a much stronger uh, cranking of the starter because it's, you know, a lithium iron phosphate batteries, can, they pump out like, uh, I don't remember the exact amount, but 600 plus uh, cold cranking amps compared to like a UASA. I believe this one's three something. Uh, now 270 so you're getting almost uh, just over double the cranking ability uh, But they're also able to maintain their char their uh, voltage throughout the use a lot better than AGM it can um, So an AGM battery I'll put a graphic up for this but an AGM will slowly drop its voltage as it's being used um, Where a lithium iron phosphate will maintain a pretty much stable voltage across the board until it's about dead And that's when it'll drop off um, so what that means is your electronics on the sea are happier because it's it's a very, very stable and clean voltage curve. Um, your rectifier doesn't have to do as much to maintain that voltage. Uh, everything on the ski is pretty much happy. The downside is a, a pitfall of one of the benefits that I mentioned, which is the stable voltage. Um, and sea have a... Uh, a, a like a battery voltage detection system kind of thing built in and what that does is it recognizes when a battery gets down to say 12.4 volts or something like that uh, that it's it's getting close to um, a dead battery and that's when it'll pump up that warning on the dash and say hey your battery's low but it'll also shut the ski off if you're in accessory mode listening to music so if you're out in the middle of the water and you're listening to music but the engine's off it knows it has to shut off at a certain point in order for it to still have enough power to start the engine. Um, with lithium, it can't do that because if it's at, you know, 12.9 volts, 12.9 volts, 12.9 volts, and then it shuts off, the CD is never going to know uh, when it's the uh, when it's when it's almost empty. So if you're out there listening to music, you'll never know if you uh, if you're close to an end of charge because you're sitting there and you're like, you know, damn, this battery's going on forever. It's not. It didn't shut off yet, so I know I still have a lot of power left. Uh, but that's not the case. It'll just shut off and then you're stranded. Um, the other part is lithium iron phosphate batteries need a battery management system. And it's just some circuitry that's on the battery. And that's what charge, or that's what handles the charging, discharging, 
regulates voltage and temperature and all that stuff. Um, and what that means is you have to use a special lithium charger to charge the battery. NoGo happens to have that just by default. There's a lithium mode. Uh, if you plug a lithium battery in, it'll detect that. Um, but the other part is you can't jump your ski if you have a lithium iron phosphate battery because it's not compatible with the BMS. So if you're out riding and you have an AGM battery and you're riding with friends or you have a portable lithium jump pack, which I always keep on board, um, you can use that in a you know in an emergency situation. But if you have a lithium iron phosphate battery uh, and the battery goes flat on the water, there's nothing you can do. You just have to get towed home. You can't jump them. You can't use lithium jump packs on on a lithium iron phosphate battery. So there's pros and cons. Um, for some people, the lithium iron phosphate batteries work perfectly fine. Um, I personally am still sticking to AGM batteries just because I like to have the ability to jump the battery if I need to. Um, but I also like having that voltage protection system built into the ski where I know, hey, if the battery warning comes up or if my speakers stop playing when I'm out in the water, that means my battery's almost dead. I should probably start the engine just to make sure I get a charge back in there and I'm good to go. Um, so that's pretty much it for this video. Just wanted to go over how to maintain it how to test it, and the different issues you can have or run into if you have a, uh, a bad battery or a battery that's near end of life. Uh, if you have any questions, um, if you want to know more or anything like that, just let me know and I'll be happy to answer them.